We have a one-two punch for some Earth-directed solar storms, some big flare players return, and that total solar eclipse we had recently, well, it had a surprise. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash SWEN. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week picks up in a big way, but first take a look at our sun. This is what the sun looked like on April 8th during the total solar eclipse. And in fact, we had a couple big prominences here and here that featured, well, prominently during total totality. But there's something interesting about these prominences that you can't see unless you're looking from space. So we'll have to talk more about that surprise in a minute. Meanwhile, as we take a look at the rest of our solar disk, there hasn't been a lot of activity all that much. We kind of, whoops, Pate watched the moon go by. We kind of waited for the moon and the whole solar eclipse thing to go before activity really began to pick up. But we've had a few eruptions here in uh, the upper part of the sun. In fact, a couple of them, there's one right there, and then you'll see two filaments, one and two whoosh right there. Those, those little eruptions actually have sent an Earth-directed solar storm our way. In fact, when we take a look at coronagraphs, you can see a little bit of this kind of partial halo from stereos. A coronagraph right there. But that is not a big storm. It's mostly going to go east of Earth, but it's got a little bit of a, of a, a finger-like part that's going to actually hit Earth. Not going to expect all that much, but starting around the 14th. Then we're going to have, as you notice here, you'll see a big eruption begin, and then there'll be something right in this area as well. It's kind of like a bang-bang kind of thing. So whoosh right there, and then right here, whoosh right here. You see this? This one, actually, as we take a look at coronagraphs, you'll see a little bit of a halo. Look at that whoosh. See that right there? This is a halo as well. Once again, kind of wispy, but this one is much more Earth-directed. So between those two eruptions, we actually do have two solar storms on their way to Earth. One should be hitting right around the uh, 14th, and then the other one could be hitting in the 15th. But we'll just have to see how, how quickly they arrive. But this could mean some decent shows for aurora photographers. Meanwhile, look at all of the activity on the east limb. That big eruption that went off to the east, that is from old region 3614. Uh, that one has still yet to rotate into Earth view. But old region 3615 and 23 are rotating into Earth view. You can see them right here. They've been renumbered region 3637 and 36. 38, and you just saw a big solar flare from them. We're expecting to get a lot more radio blackouts from these regions over the course of this next week, and possibly Earth-directed solar storms. So aurora photographers, get ready, and amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, expect more uh, noise on the dayside radio bands. Now, switching to our M-flare threat meter and dayside radio blackout meter, take a look at the X-ray flux over this past week. You can see it right about the 10th really begin to climb. We started on the 11th popping some big solar flares. In fact, we had a big solar eruption there too, but we actually have been popping several big uh, M-class flares, and so we're going to see more activity like this. Expect big radio blackouts on Earth's day side easily over this week and next week before things finally begin to settle down. Now, as we return to those two solar storms that were on their way to Earth, we switch to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. Now, as we set this solar storm model in motion, you can see that very first solar storm being launched to the east. It looks like it's mainly going to miss Earth, but there is this finger-like tail that's going to be actually tracking across Earth. So we're going to get a glancing blue 
blow from this solar storm. And then you can see the second solar storm being launched shortly thereafter. This is the one that's much more of a direct hit. This is the one that gave us that pretty halo in the Lasco uh, coronagraph imagery. Now, both of these solar storms, as they track out, it looks like the first one's going to hit Earth basically early on the 14th, maybe late on the 13th, but likely into the 14th because we have some really slow solar wind ahead of this solar storm. And then also once that second solar storm begins and it hits, it looks like that's going to hit us about mid-afternoon on the 14th, but likely again, it's probably going to be held up by traffic on the way. So don't be surprised if it hits us on the 15th, but that's the one-two punch and that could definitely bring Aurora clear down to mid-latitudes. And so Aurora photographers, be sure to keep your batteries charged. And although we haven't had any solar storms as of late with gorgeous Aurora, we did have a total solar eclipse that graced the skies over the entire North American continent. So we do have some gorgeous shots to share, including this one, which is a flight during totality. Can you imagine having a flight with a solar eclipse like this? Must have been such an incredibly surreal experience. And we had some gorgeous shots of the eclipse in Arkansas, including you can see even the, the prominences. And it was visible in Oklahoma. And we saw it in St. Louis with some Bailey beads. There's a triple Bailey beads. And you can see the, how strongly the prominences stood out. And it was seen again in Illinois. Again, Bailey beads and those prominences. That tells you how bright they were. And it was seen in Indianapolis, Indiana, and you can see once again some of the prominences. And it was seen in Vermont. Look at the prominences here, especially looking at the detail. And it was also seen in New Hampshire, the strong corona. Notice the big bright region down here where that big prominence is. And there's the detail of the prominences. And then for some fun, here is Sugarloaf, Maine where people were skiing under the totality. And I think GoPro even has a big movie of people skiing in totality. I don't know about you, I would absolutely wreck if that were me. And then even the prominences here were so incredibly bright. You can see this in Arkansas. This is a back of the camera shot. Not only are the prominences competing with the Bailey beads, but they're unbelievably bright even here. And that brings me back to the idea of what's going on exactly with these prominences. Where's the surprise? Well, in order to see that surprise, we have to pay closer attention to those solar prominences, and we need to compare space-based imagery with that of the solar eclipse from the ground. So as we put the two images side by side, this is from the space telescopes during totality, and this is obviously from the ground during totality, you can see the prominent structures are in a different location, both uh, in the space compared to on the ground, right? So how do we do this? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to make the sun, let's take a big picture of the sun and look where those prominences are, right? We see them right here. Now let's overlay that uh, solar eclipse image. And so we'll pull that up here. And now you can see we've got the prominences from the solar eclipse, you can see them here, compared to the prominences on the space telescope imagery. And so we're going to need to actually uh, rotate the sun in order to kind of get that in the right location. So let's do that. Let's rotate that sun right there. Now we've got those prominences. You can see they're all lined up exactly the same way. Now on top of that, let's change the uh, imagery from the 304 angstroms to something that gives us a bit more view out further in the uh, chromosphere and in the corona. And as we light that up, you can see all the way around, the prominences are a little bit harder to see, but if you start seeing out here in the further part of the atmosphere, you start noticing an interesting feature. So let's let that take that eclipse image away to kind of make it a little bit clearer. So we're just looking at uh, space-based imagery from this point on. So then you can start really taking a really close look at what is this feature that seems to be stuck at the very tip of that prominence. And as we blow that image up, you can see what looks to be somewhat like a semicircle underneath that prominence, maybe even attached to it. And we'll blow that up even more. And as we blow it up really large, now you begin to see this 
kind of interesting, hollowed out, very dark region here, much more dark than the surroundings. And it looks like it's actually tethered. And there are some people who have seen these structures in the past, and they think that this is an alien spaceship, like a big black sphere, and it's got a a tube coming down here and it's refueling from the sun because it's using the plasma from the sun, sucking it right up into it. But what this actually is, is the magnetic core of a big solar storm that has yet to be launched. We call these flux rope structures and the reason why is because they look very much like big coils but they're made of magnetic field and they hollow out this region, but that's why they're curved like this. And if you look closely, you can even see some of the magnetic field that's lit up in the solar atmosphere, looking almost as if it is kind of caging and helping to keep that big solar slinky tucked away before it actually erupts into a big solar storm. And the fact that you got to see one of these solar storms tethered to the top of a prominence during a total solar eclipse before the solar storm launched, well, that is a very neat surprise. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, we can no longer use Stereo A imagery to take a look at the sun's far side because Stereo A is staring at the same side of the sun that we are. So we have to simulate the far side by using SDO AIA and HMI imagery of about two weeks ago to get an idea of what might be lurking on the sun's far side. And as we take a look, Oh my goodness, there's a lot going on but far side. It, we've seen region 36, 14, and 15. These were the big X flare players and solar storm producers that are now rotating back into Earth view. Region 36, 14 has yet to completely come into view, but it sure looks like some stuff is going on there. Plus, we have a few other regions as well that were flare active. In fact, as we pull up the JSOC HMI helioseismology far sided monitor, you can see these regions as they were rotating through the sun's front side. As they go into the gold area, that is the sun's far side. And you start looking for big dark regions. So region 3621 even has given us a little bit of activity. But look how big region 3615 and 14 remained. But they're not the only ones. Region 3619 and 22 are also surviving their far side passage. So as these regions begin to rotate back into Earth view, not only are we going to get a lot of activity uh, along with big radio blackouts from regions from these two regions returning into view, but region 3619 and 22 will as well. So we will have easily two weeks, if not more than that, of boosted X-ray flux, big solar flares, as well as the potential for big solar storms before we get to yet another kind of dead zone in the sun. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect a lot of noise on the bands over the next two to possibly three weeks before things calm down. And aurora photographers, well, we may have more chances for solar storms coming up very soon. Now, switching to our moon, we are coming out of the new moon and passing through the first quarter phase. And by the 18th, our moon will be about 75% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora, well, you're going to have this companion to deal with. So you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Now, switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating that one-two punch from those two solar storms that are on their way to Earth. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting minor storm conditions with up to about a 65% chance of a major storm. And I'm going to extend that in through the 15th because likely this, the second solar storm in particular is going to be a bit on the late side. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get a decent show and it may even continue into the 16th before things begin to calm down. Now at mid latitudes, well, we are still expecting at least active conditions from these solar storms, but we do have up to a 30 or 35% chance of a minor storm. And this again could be around the 15th when things begin to peak, but it things should also settle down quite quickly because about about the 16th into the 17th, it should be pretty quiet at mid latitudes because we're not expecting the biggest punches from these particular solar storms. So war photographer, if you're at mid latitudes, be sure to catch the storms early and be on it because they won't last for all that long. 
Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting well in the triple digits this week, and the numbers could rise. We could be easily into the 160s, possibly the 170s by the end of the week. And this is because of all of those active regions that are now rotating into Earth view. We are sitting at moderate noise level on the bands, on the dayside radio bands. NOAA is giving us about a 35% chance of M class flares at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and even a 5% chance of X class flares at an R3 level radio blackout. And this will continue easily throughout this week. And again, the numbers, the risks may rise as we move into next week, depending upon how those new active regions look as they rotate into view. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect your radio blackouts to be on the menu this week and next week before things begin to settle down. So you're just going to have to kind of grin and bear it. Now, switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, everything is in the green when it comes to big radiation storms. We're sitting at the D1 normal range, and this is for you aviators at flight level 360, which is also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. And NOAA's giving us only about a 1% chance of a radiation storm at an S1 to S2 level easily over the next few days. We might see that risk rise just a little bit as we move into the end of this week, and that's because we have a couple regions that are going to be rotating to the west limb that might give us a little bit of a chance of radiation storms. But for the most part, everything will remain nice and calm. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and you high-risk passengers, you need to stay vigilant. But for right now, everything looks good. So the space weather this week is getting very exciting. We have that one-two punch from those two solar storms that are on their way to Earth. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get a show. And even Aurora photographers at mid-latitudes could get a show, but you're going to need to stay on your toes because it may not last all that long. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, this isn't eclipse week and the sun is done with being quiet. So it's getting noisy again and you're going to have to deal with a lot more noise on the bands. And radio blackouts are also at play this week and possibly in through next week. We could even get R2 and possibly R3 level radio blackouts if the regions that are rotating into Earth view are as noisy as they were the last time around. So just kind of grin and bear it over this next week or possibly two weeks before things settle down. And now you GPS users, well, you know, we do have those solar storms that are on their way to Earth, and when they hit, that could cause GPS reception issues on, the, on Earth's night side, especially anywhere near Aurora. And then we also have radio blackouts picking up again, so we might have GPS reception issues on Earth's day side as well. So you're going to have to just need to get through the next few days before things settle down a little bit, and always be careful careful near dawn and near dusk because that's when GPS reception is always a bit dicey anyway. And if you're a drone pilot or UAV flyer, be sure when the solar storm hits to calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.